Hi, I'm Chris Howard. Welcome to Top of Mind. Recently, I was on Stanford campus in Palo Alto, California for a seminar on AI and the law. It was really inspiring. And at the end of it, I took some time on campus and just shot a little video talking about neurosymbolic AI. So I'd like you to watch that and then we're going to come back and talk about that some more. This is a really quick top of mind because it really is top of mind. You might be able to tell that I'm on Stanford campus in Palo Alto, absolutely stunning place. I've been coming here for many, many years. Never ceases to amaze me just how pretty this place is. But I've been in three days of intensive workshops around applied AI in law, uh, in learning say, about things like computable contracts, how you capture the logic of law in models and use AI to interrogate them and design them. It's fascinating. But one of the things that I'm thinking about as a result of these discussions is whether the pursuit of 100% accuracy in large language models is actually a useful goal or not. Maybe the utility of a large language model has much more to do with fluency, so the ability to communicate with information as opposed to having the information itself. And so I'm kind of thinking through this and the relationship between uh, neuro-symbolic aspects of AI, so neural being things like large language models, and the symbolic being things like knowledge management, knowledge graphs, that kind of technology, and how those two things really should work together in the pursuit of better results, as opposed to all of the sort of very high focus on LLMs right now that may never be 100% accurate. So I wanted to get that thought out of my head uh, while I'm still here before I head back to the hotel and then on to, on to home. Uh, and so been really inspiring, which is not unusual, to have a couple of days away to, to think and to synthesize ideas, uh, really important in the role that I have. And so more on this to come as I think it through some more. Thanks. Neurosymbolic artificial intelligence. That's a, it's a mouthful and it sounds really complicated, but it actually is really just a fusion of styles of artificial intelligence. And no coincidence that we're exploring these as we hit the trough of disillusionment with generative AI. Remember that the trough is a place where kind of the magic burns off a little bit and you realize that some things are harder than others and maybe it doesn't work exactly the way that you thought or is expensive and so on and so on. But one of the other things that happens in the trough of disillusionment is you look at adjacencies. What are the things that are related to what I'm trying to do that if I actually use them in combination might actually produce better results? So what I was thinking about when I shot that little video on campus is that maybe we're asking too much of large language models to be accurate, to be 100% precise. Maybe that's not the goal. Maybe that's an unreachable goal. Maybe what their advantage is is actually more about fluency or creativity or conversation. But you think of generative AI as a way of seeing your data differently, whether that's text or images or designs and the recombinations of those things, that's fundamentally a creative kind of act. And maybe it opens up new possibilities and new ways of seeing things. And so that's neural AI, so based on neural networks and unsupervised learning, those types of techniques. But symbolic AI is much more structured and uses tags and things like knowledge graphs and embedding to really build the relationship between entities so you see how they relate to one another. But also if there's a change in one area, how something else changes in that structure, kind of like a state machine. And so that's much more about accuracy, but it's actually really hard to read. Like as a human, a machine can read it, but harder for a human. So you think about bringing those two things together, you have a combination of accuracy and fluency as a way of inspecting the data and the relationships that you have. That's neurosymbolic AI, the combination of neural techniques and symbolic techniques. And there are lots of them, more than I can go into here, but that's something I wanna spend some time thinking about, but also that we're spending time writing about. How do these combinations of AI techniques come together for the purpose of solving a hard problem? One of the things that we explored at the seminar at Stanford, the law school, was this idea of ambiguity and vagueness. And of course, ambiguity is really bad if you want to have a real decision made about something and it's crystal clear. And the law, of course, that's what the law is for, is to help guide towards a decision that's like super clear. And ambiguity is not great in those scenarios. But law is very structured. There's sort of a tree of, of logical steps that can lead you to a conclusion. So ambiguity would be bad in that situation. But sometimes ambiguity and vagueness is required for problem solving, where there's enough space in the answer or the options that you can apply creativity to come up with a solution. 
And it seems to me that the generative AI tools, that that's what they're really good at, the sort of creating options for you. If you take generative design, for example, where you're using generative AI to create design options for pieces of hardware, for example, or floor layouts and that kind of thing, uh, that's a place where you actually want some innovation and maybe some ideas that you haven't thought of before and where there's much more tolerance for inaccuracy because you're looking for new ideas. And so using generative AI in that way is actually a super creative effort. And again, combining that where you need it with data that comes from highly structured formats to in inject that accuracy where it's required. So let's talk for a second about happy accidents. If you're using technologies or ideas or, or methodologies that are creating options, chances are not all those options are a great fit or they don't look right or they don't actually fit the logic, they don't solve the problem. But what great designers do is they keep that stuff around. So if you go to say the D school at Stanford, which is their design school, you can see prototypes everywhere from failed projects. Like if they created something, they created options for something, it wasn't the right fit at the right time, but it could be right for something in the future. It's like an adjacency, you're keeping it there waiting for it to apply. And sometimes these accidents become like true product innovations. Like in the case of, of Post-it notes, for example. So the scientist who was working on uh, adhesives was actually looking for super strong adhesives that would bind together and went to a seminar on microspheres, which is a type of bonding agent. But actually the way that they work is they bond, but they don't stick really tight. And so he dismissed it as something like, okay, that doesn't apply to the experiments that I'm doing right now but actually came back to him when he was looking for this really lightweight adhesive that could be reused and reused and reused to share ideas, post-it notes. Some other accidents, of course, happen in the arts. I'll give you a couple of music examples. So the Dave Brubeck Quartet concert at Carnegie Hall, there's an, almost a mistake at the end of the bass solo in the first tune where he hits this note that's like so outside the key that it seems like it doesn't fit. But what happens over the next hour and a half is they keep coming back to that note. It happened to be an E, you keep coming back to that note and all these kind of weird combinations, and it becomes this through line to the whole concert started as a mistake. One other example I'll give you is uh, Pat Metheny album from ages ago, from the 70s, As Falls Wichita. Uh, there's uh, a 22-minute cut in there, and in the middle of it, you hear is like weird speaking, like just numbers that seem like random numbers. Well, what that is, is the keyboard is cue track to say, well, here's where a change happens, here's where a change happens. And by mistake, they included it as part of the mix. They liked it so much that they kept it. Look for mistakes, be creative, use the tools that you have at your disposal for the things they're best aimed at. Good luck. Thanks for joining me. I'm Chris Howard. We'll see you next time.